Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge, and welcome to Eldridge and Company. I love Maury Rubin's story. He found that he loved to bake, so he opened a bakery. And uh, it's a little more complicated than that, isn't it, Maury? It's, it's got a little more nuance to right. it than that. So, but in a certain way, it's just that simple. So what do you bake? <laughs> I bake classic French pastry. Um, I'm a classically trained French pastry chef and baker, but it doesn't look like what I think people think of when they hear French pastry. Right? What, so what French does pastry. French pastry look like? I mean, what is your classic <clears throat> French pastry? Well, it, beginning with a croissant, and I think most people, it's fair to say most people know what a croissant looks like. But I think if you say French pastry, beginning with eclairs, yeah. it, it's got, there's a sort of frou-frou element. It's yeah. got, you think of decoration, you think of fancy decoration, you think of lots a lot of, of cream. cream and piping and stars and flowers and stuff like that. And, and my stuff's not like that at all. So where do you bake? Let's get down to it. How do you, where do you bake there? <laughs> City Bakery is my bakery. And you own it. And I own it. And you operate it. I operate it. And you bake Very much there. so. And, and you I bake, bake there. there. Right. What time do you get there in the morning? To well, bake? it's not such a romantic answer anymore. Oh. It, yeah. For, but for years it was. I, yeah. I, I walked through that fire, believe me. It was uh, in the early days. The bakery's 13 years old now. In the early days, I would get in at 3 o'clock in the morning, and <laughs> I would bake until about 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and I would do paperwork, and then I would try to uh, do whatever else I needed to do, and I'd go home about 10 o'clock at night, and I'd be back at 3 o'clock in the morning. And that was my real schedule for six days a week for the first four or five years of the business. So you didn't, how old is the business you just said? Eight? Uh, coming up on 13 years. 13 years. But before 13 years, you didn't always, you weren't always a baker. I never baked. No. Never. So let's, this is the story I love. Okay. What were you doing? <laughs> I was a television producer and director for Howard Cosell at ABC. And Howard Cosell was that great sports right. writer and uh, great character. Right. right. Character, living legend, sportscaster. Right. And you used to order lunch in and stuff like that? <laughs> um, you, we didn't have time to go out so much for yeah. lunch. Yeah. So were you particular about food? Have you always been? I don't think so. Uh, I really don't. So then he retired. Is that what happened? What Howard happened? was about to retire. I was looking into film as opposed to television. I was thinking about documentary work f instead of sports. And um, so when and I had a very tough first job to beat because this yeah. was my first job and Howard was my first boss. And How did you get that job? I got that job because, I mean, when I was a kid, I knew I wanted to do something with, with sports and media, whether it was writing or radio or TV. Where did you grow up, in New York? I grew up in the suburbs of Baltimore, uh -huh. a sports crazy kid in the suburbs of Baltimore, which is a good place to be a sports crazy kid. Right. Um, I went to <laughs> the University of Maryland, which had good sports teams at the time, <laughs> which was not, which was, which was sort of incidental to this whole thing, or not incidental to this yeah. whole thing. Um, so I worked at the college radio station, and I was on, I was the play-by-play -play of the basketball team and the football team. And then I, from that, I met, started meeting people in television, and I sort of, I sort of mortgaged my college weekends to drive to televised basketball or football games all around the East Coast to work for thirty-five dollars for a weekend. And in doing that, I uh, missed out on a lot of socializing in college, but I got a <laughs> a very considerable foot in the door so that when I graduated school I got hired by ABC. That's so great. Sort and, of the old-fashioned way. Yeah, and Howard was a great character to work with. Howard was, um, was one of a kind. Howard was great and I have, yeah. I had and have a lot of affection for him. Right. And so when did he retire? This was in 1985. He was getting ready to pack up. He was down to... Uh, How uh, old was he? Was um, he was late 60s. So he wasn't that old. He wasn't that old. He was a little bit worn. Yeah. He, I mean, he was a well, very he did vital a lot guy. Of traveling and he, a lot of. Yeah, he, he traveled around for. I mean, he traveled around. He was a very vital guy. Yeah. The staff, we were all in our early 20s, and, and Howard, honestly, he really, truly had, had as much or more energy as all of us. He really did. Um, but he, he sort of he got to a point where it just, it just stopped. I think the energy stopped, and his wife died, and he was very close to his wife. And I think from the time his wife died, that was it. That was it. Yeah. yeah. So then you were faced with I, I no knew, program. Right. I mean, what I really, besides Howard's leaving, it's that I really wanted to do serious journalism, documentary work, and the kind of show that I would have liked to have done 
was really something like CBS reports with Edward Murrow. That is, I mean, stuff that I knew was, that was, I thought, becoming extinct. And this was in the age of, this was just when Donahue and Oprah were were on television and just becoming a big deal. And I and when I, was this? What was it? This was the mid '80s. Mid '80s. And I really thought that that was in a in a not for better. That was really what journalism was was becoming, and that that was not a future that I was interested in at all. So there was nothing happening with serious documentary work in film, and I had had the benefit of working so hard for five years with Howard and never having a chance to spend a dollar that I made. I had some money in the bank, so I decided to take a break and move to Paris. Very nice. You know, I worked at CBS at the height of the Murrow Times. He used to get into the elevator and Edward R. Murrow would be there and he was always very elegant with his silk cravat and everything and it would be a hush there. It was a great it's time and wonderful television and the change has been incredible. Right. I was in I was in there in the lobby a couple of weeks ago yeah. and I had never seen this plaque of CBS news plaques by the elevator yeah. bank and I'll tell you that stuff has has a lot of weight for me. Yeah. It was interesting and we were at 485 Madison then which is a office building still in existence at 52nd Street and when um, I was there they had just bought the Sheffield Farms building and the bu the production center on West 57th Street right. was a, was an actual dairy place for Sheffield Farms milk. See, it's all connected. So it's all, it's all <laughs> so all now connected. you're back at yeah. baking. Right. <laughs> so that love is a very it, elliptical, I, is that what they call it or something? I, I should know. ask, how, how, how was the cream? <laughs> it was delicious and yeah. very heavy. So you went to Paris. I went to Paris. And you just hung out? Yeah, I mean you the made up for all the socializing and yeah, the, well, yeah. I, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the plan was to, to do nothing. It really was. It was yeah. to do nothing at all. And then I thought, I shouldn't do absolutely nothing. So I, t I signed up for a pastry class for fun, a six-day pastry class in the countryside of France. It was me and I think 10 or 11 wealthy housewives from California. And it was with this pastry chef who's one of the famous pastry chefs in France. And it was a very fixating experience. It was fabulous. It was, it was remarkably creative and, and inspiring. And, um, and I got smitten right there. Isn't that interesting? Did you ever do anything with your hands before? No. no. I mean, I played the drums growing up as a yeah. kid, like school band, yeah. but that was it. And you never cooked at home? Not a cook at home. <laughs> Did your mother bake? Home. Yeah. My mother yeah. was a, you know, was a... a what, so what was it that really... Thanks for really, saving me there. That's all right. Yeah. What was it that caught you with... Um, I... Uh, what was smells. it that caught me? I think, it, I think <laughs> that at that point, it was about the creativity. And it was about my, my head was in a place <coughs> of, um, really from television, of, of just ideas. And it didn't matter that in television it was in my hands and now this was, this was my hands. It was more that I just, I saw it as this very broad, very wide open creative opportunity. And that's, that was the formative thing. And you really produce something, a product. I don't know, does that have anything to do with it? Yeah, it does. I mean, you hear yeah. a lot of, with bread especially, yeah, you, you hear a lot of bread bakers say that, you know, it's, just, right, it's a very tactile yeah. thing and you yeah. get to your, your hands and you're mushing yeah. it around yeah. and it's a very therapeutic thing for a lot of people. For me, it was more, I would say, um, it was partially about, okay, I like working with my hands, but the balance of it for me, the, the greater part of the interest was really about the ideas, about being able to be creative with this stuff. This stuff just happened to be butter and sugar and eggs. But it was more that I got to sort of do design and I got to think about these creative ideas and I got to give them dopey names. And, and in that way, it was this very wide open canvas for being creative. So you, did you stay there longer than a week? No, literally six days. Yeah. That was it. I went back to Paris and I said to the pastry chef, I said, listen, I'm going to be in Paris for maybe six months and I have no plans and can I come work in your place and he said I uh, he said I have a waiting list of a year but I have a friend who has a place in a working class neighborhood and I'll get you in there and he did and so how long were you there for the rest of the six I was months? there for about six months at that place and I ended up spending about a year there uh -huh. I spent six months at this other bakery and that other bakery was really the the Good. that was the the binding experience because that was great. I just got plunked down in this place and 
It was me and three people in the kitchen. It was two French guys, a North African guy. They had no idea of what the hell this guy was doing. Why was he there? He was a TV guy, I think. He's something like TV. I spoke no French. I was they gonna spoke, ask you who spoke French. I didn't no. speak any French. They spoke no <laughs> English. Which is a very interesting way to yeah, learn. Right. Because the you know, the work itself becomes the middle ground of communication. Right. And that was really neat. And that really expedited how I learned. So interesting. And then you came, then, so then what happened? You came back here, your end of year, six months? Or I came back here. I think it was, there was... Longer than that. It was the year. It was a year, yeah. I came back here, and because I learned from the French, I learned French pastry from the French, and I had, I had great respect for the system. And, and the neat thing about the, the place of, Fr of pastry in French culture is that it is very serious to them. And there's this one-for-all attitude. And, and this thing I said about they didn't know what the hell I was doing there and all that, it didn't really matter. They taught me everything they could. And they were incredibly forthcoming and, and earnest about here's what we do and here's what you need to do. And, and it was great. And I learned, I, I learned a great deal, but I didn't know how much I had learned at the time yeah. because I didn't have any reference point for it. And I never baked before. So I, I, I knew what I had just learned, but I didn't know what that really meant. And it turns out, I learned a lot. <laughs> so, all right. So then you came back here. I came back Did here. Did you start to think about going into business there? I, I would say that I started to have uh, some notions of it in my head, yeah. Yeah, I did. Yeah. So then what happened? You came back here. I came back here, but I really thought, okay, I'm going to talk to TV people again and check in in the film thing. And then I think it was the week before I got back, and I was writing a, a letter to my parents, and I, and I said something about going to check in on TV. And I think when I wrote that, I said to myself, uh. no, you're not. <laughs> and I think that it was, it was a week before I got back. I thought, yeah, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep baking. Right. So tell me what happened. Well, I, I started. I was, I was obsessed with pastry. I was thrilled to be back in New York. I couldn't wait to go and check out every single bakery in New York City. Yeah. And I started just to do that legwork. And it was uh, really more in my journalist yeah, uh, right, mode. you did the investigative right, stuff. Right, right. Yeah. And, and the, the story was, it, I realized very quickly that there was lousy baking in New York. And that was when I started to realize how much I had learned. And I started to think, huh, I could do that better. Which was this major revelation to me yeah. because I thought I'd come back here, I thought I'd find a place, go work, still apprentice to somebody, and that there would be years of learning. And I just thought, you know what, I can do this myself. So I started thinking about a bakery. That was when I started thinking about a bakery in earnest, and I started to work on it right away. So you obviously always had that entrepreneurial kind of thing because you managed to go college weekends around to different stations, and you did the, the filming of, of shows and stuff like that. Right. So it's so interesting, isn't it, to see how that comes and you didn't even realize or appreciate what you had? I would say that I didn't realize yeah. it. Even now, I mean, I think of it in, in such uh, sort of project-specific they, they, they were such they were so specific endeavors that I don't think of it well I was very entrepreneurial I mean I really don't I mean I yeah. worked when I was a kid I worked from the time that I was 16 I were actually like I had a paper route and you know my neighbor and I made four I split it with my friend Bobby Polikoff and we did every <laughs> other day and I made four dollars and fifty cents it yeah. sounds like it was the 1940s but yeah. it wasn't um, yeah. Yeah. but that's what that was the going rate for a paper route in the yeah. suburbs of Baltimore in the 1960s um, so I guess, yeah, okay. So then how did you go about getting all this equipment? How did, I mean, how did you do this? Did you have enough money to do it? Did you have to go someplace and get money? I had did you use your charge cards? What did you do? Um, I wrote, uh, <laughs> the first thing I did was I went to Maine for the summer, and I became, <laughs> I became the baker at a resort where I was the one and only baker. Uh -huh. And I, I used it as a test of, okay, I have to make breakfast, lunch, and dinner dessert for 125 people seven days a week for two months. And I did that, and it worked, and it was great, and they loved me. <laughs> so that was the first thing. I came back to New York, and I started writing a business plan. And, uh, you know, the New York City Public Library was my friend then. And one of my customers now, years later, and I love this, is Paul LeClerc, who's the president oh, of the New York so Public great. Library. And he loved City Bakery. And, I, you know, it was a total thrill to get to say to him, you know what? I wrote the business plan for City Bakery at the Donnell Library on East 53rd Street. So how did you even know you needed a business plan? It's just a sophisticated knowledge? I knew nothing about business, right. but, I, but I knew that, okay, need I needed to raise plan. money. I didn't have the money, uh -huh. so I needed oh. to raise money, 
and I wrote a business plan. And the deal with writing a business plan for a bakery in 1980, this was now October 1987, was I knew no one who knew anyone who had ever made money investing in a bakery. Right. It was not quite uh, investment territory. And also, October 87 was when the stock market took a big... Ran down. Right. So then where'd you go? How did you do that? You just... Um, I just started talking to anybody I knew who had money. And it took three years. It took three, it did years. Take three years. Yeah, and the, the thing so was. So, what did you do in those three years? I worked a little bit of freelance for ABC. Uh -huh. um, so, I, I still had my director's guild card. Right. So, I still did a little bit of just part time, like nothing TV work, but, right. but it paid so well that, I, that I, I kept some money in my pocket that way and I ran out of the money that I had saved. And my deal with myself was that I just have to get this bakery open before I run out of money. So, then you, you raised the money. I and, you went, money. and then you had to decide where you were going to put the bakery. Right. But you did? I did early because I loved the farmer's market mm. at Union Square. And the farmer's market at Union Square was, was a perfect, um, for me, it was a touchstone of, of learning to love food in Paris because there's farmer's markets everywhere in Paris. So I knew right away that I wanted to be in Union Square. And I based the whole business plan on the idea that Union Square needs something like my bakery. It's got a lot of nice restaurants, white tablecloth sit-down restaurants, and it's got a lot of 2,000-year-old coffee shops and nothing in the middle. So you then opened a little store. I opened a little store. At where? Uh, 22 East 17th Street. And you served what? You um, baked 3 o'clock in the morning? I baked, uh, we baked croissant. It was really more French pastry than not. Yeah. Um, paste, uh, croissant and chocolate croissant and things like Pear Raisin Danish, which is the, my name for Pen or Raisin, which is a class, very classic French thing. Um, and then a little lunch menu that was a uh, tuna sandwich, a pizza, a special pizza of the day, tomato soup, and two salads every day. And you, did you do the cooking? Yeah, I did. There were, other, there, were, there were three people in the original kitchen, which is so hard to imagine right now. Yeah. The bakery right now is 50 people. So now, let's talk about the bakery now. It's called the City Bakery, and it's now not on that street. It's up on 18th Street. We moved a block three years ago. Right. And it's a big place. It's a big place. How it, many people does it seat? It seats 120. City Bakery on 17th Street seated 32. And this yeah. is now 120. It's five times the size. And you serve a full range of food. We serve, uh, we serve breakfast, lunch. Lunch has become a big, big part of the business. Yeah. Lunch has become the part of the business that really helped to grow the business from 17th Street to 18th Street. And, and a couple years into 17th Street, I, when I started to learn some of the lessons of small business, I realized that it made no sense for me to be making the fresh mayonnaise every day for the tuna salad sandwich. And, <laughs> and I handed that stuff off. So then I handed it off again, and I've been basically involved in handing off the kitchen over the years for uh, in many different levels. But you're there every day. I'm there every day. But you're not there at 3 o'clock in the I'm morning. I'm not there at 3 o'clock in the morning, thank God. Um, and w so what's it like to be a small... You're a small business owner. I'm a small business owner. What's it like in New York City to be a small business owner? Um, well, it's a, it's, there's a lot that you're up against. And to be a... a Food business in New York City, there's, there's an awful lot of, I think, I'd say regulatory stuff mm. that you're up against. I want to say that, that in a fundamental way, though, the answer to the question is, it's Exciting. fabulous. It's so different. It's the greatest, it's just the greatest thing in the world. What I love is the difference between that and television, because television, you don't see the audience. You don't have that immediate feedback or anything. You have this restaurant, people are in and out all day long, and I've, I've been told by somebody who's not happy, it only opens at 7.30 or 7? 7? 7.30. 7.30 in the morning. He yeah. wants you to open at 6.30. But from 7.30 in the morning until what time do you close? 7 at night. 7 at night. You've got Seven people days a week. in and out. You see what they're eating. You see the fun they're having. You see the whole place. It's just right in the middle of everything you're doing, and that has to be very exciting. Yeah, it's immediate. It's great. Yeah. And, and, and especially... Our customers are really a beloved, loyal, like fabulously loyal yeah. group, and it's great. And it's a great neighborhood. It's, I love the neighborhood. Yeah. It's, it's changed a lot in 13 years, it's, but it's still pretty... So I love your story because I'm now 73 years old, and I still haven't figured out what to do with my life, and I can draw all these parallels. You know, I come out of a political background, which is nothing but talk. Talk, 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 talk. And I always love the idea that you are actually producing not a film and not a tape, but you're producing something that people really consume and get pleasure from it. I just think it's 
Absolutely fabulous. You know, there's a, I have a 5 a.m. muffin slot that's open. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, tell me about you have a chef. How did you get her? You told me this story. The, the person who now makes all the savory food um, from the days after I stopped making yeah. the mayonnaise, her name is Eileen Rosen, and she was a customer. And this is one of these, like, these yeah. stories about like, how like, the notion of a small business in a community and how it, it, it feeds on itself and grows. And, and Eileen was a customer, and she was an everyday customer. And, then, and she's, she was married, and she had uh, twin girls, and then she started to get spilkies <laughs> about wanting to get back to work. And she uh, went to sign up for cooking school. She worked in design. She went to cooking school at uh, French Culinary in, down on Broadway. Right. And she wrote, I think, on, on an application, like, why are you in cooking school? I want to work at City Bakery one day. Oh, and so she's, she's immensely talented and creative. And she finished, she was great at school, and then she came and applied to a job. And, and she had called me for a while. And, and when I saw her, I said, oh, I know you, you're a customer. <laughs> and, and then the rest is that she, I hired her. Her first year was this very experimental. She never had a food job before, right. but I never had a food job before, right. so it just made perfect sense to me. And a lot of the people at the bakery over the years who have been key people are people doing something for the first time, because that's now sort that's of... That's another one of my favorite things, because they really want to do it. It's such a difference, and because it's all experimental. It, it's a lot of experimentation, yeah. and it's, the deal for me is to find uh, smart people, people I like, uh, ambitious people, right. and just let them do it. So, so what time does she get to work? She's there before me every day. <laughs> and what actually. time do you get in? We even um, asked that. Yeah, it's a, it's Is a, that a secret? <laughs> it's not a secret, but it's a relatively leisure. Uh, oh, I might get there at 8 o'clock in the morning, and, yeah. and you know what? It's all fine, and the doors open, and customers are there, and there's food out, and it's great. And it and smells delicious. I still work really long hours, but I don't have to... Once you do that 3 o'clock in the morning thing, as far as I'm concerned, if you wake up, past, if you get to sleep till 5, it's all vacation. That's so wonderful. So do you ever think of making documentaries again? <sighs> no. <laughs> I, I still, my, my, I would say that journalism is my first love, and it, it'll always be my first, and I'm, I'm sort of a, I'm a newspaper fanatic, and I, when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I think of is I can't wait to read the paper. Um, and then, but it, what like, paper do you read? Um, I read the Times, I read the Washington Post, and I go online and read a couple other papers if there's stories happening. Yeah. And what do you think's happening in the news business? I think do you it, like the way they're reporting? No, I think that the, the world of journalism has uh, has really. Uh, I'm not. What's the word? It. It. I'll tell you something. I. I think that my instinct 20 years ago was was exactly right. I think that the virtue of great journalism in this country is just faded and faded, and I think that there's a lot of, of fuzzy, unfortunate work out there. Yeah. Do you? Yeah, I do. I'm married to a journalist. Do you know that? I know that. You know that? Right. Um, he thinks that uh, um, college education, <laughs> wine, health concerns, and the Internet, <laughs> but there is no longer um, the work. It's not, it's not, I mean, it's become a pass along in a way. They take the press releases and they write them or they just, there's just a whole. And Merging of, of journalism and PR. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that there, I don't, I don't, you know, the, the news hour, the news feature shows that all the networks have. Yeah. If that's the, the present day equivalent of CBS reports, then I think it's fair to say that it is. It's supposed to be. Yeah. Right. Right. It's not. So what are the issues in the world that um, most interest you? Mm, well, Since you read all the papers, I'm right, very right. up. Um, well, I love politics, and I, yeah. I, I mean, I would say that um, I, I'm, I, I'm paying attention to the world, to the world yeah. every day as it goes by. Right. Um, do you find that your customers are too? I mean, do you pick any up stuff from there? You know, I, I would say in, in a particular way that that our customers are, um, the most of the professionals are in professionally creative fields, um, be it publishing or graphics or architecture or photography. Um, and it's such a developing neighborhood. I mean, it, every day. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's really evolved. Yeah. Um, a lot of advertising there now. Right. A lot of the dot-coms were there. Um, I would say there's something about City Bakery in particular that is sort of an insulator. And I think that the, the place is a particular pleasure for, pe pleasure for people. And I think that, that it's not an intense place in terms of like 
what's happening in Iraq this morning. Yeah. What's happen- it's, it's actually, I think that people check out a little bit in a really nice way. In, in and around the bakery. Do they, yeah. read, they don't read papers while they're there? In the morning, people are reading the papers for right. sure. But I don't think it's a, it, it doesn't feel to me because I'm tuned into the customers and I'm, as a shopkeeper, I'm a listener. I'm a, I'm a right. pretty good listener. And, and it's not something that people want to talk to me about stuff that's probably more personal to them than more about like, like what do you think, you know, what do you think about the headlines today? It's yeah. funny because I'd love to, to latch onto the conversation right. about the headlines today. Right. So what headlines are most interesting to you today? Um, I don't know. That's a silly question because it's all so, in, it is all interesting. It's, as far as I'm concerned, it's all horrifying, and I'm sure it is to you too. It's, it, it's horrifying, and it's horrifying for me in a particular way of my age because when I grew up, uh, it, was, uh, it was Vietnam, and Vietnam for me was, uh, was this particular experience of what's up with human beings and why are people killing each other why is this happening and this is now you know very that's my touchstone for all of this and more than ever can we ask that question right so it's really for me um you know i'm so sorry to say this return to something that in my in my childhood at such a formative time was this just this black hole staring into trying to make sense of it's um, it's a wor- so it's it's a world that I yeah we've just lost that sense of being kind and and um, kind of gentle, right? It well it's very different than running than it's it's very different than trying to provide a friendly smile when you serve someone a cup of coffee in your community. <laughs> I'll tell you that. But you love doing that, and I ho- and I know the viewers can immediately know why I love you. I just think this whole story is wonderful. And I think um, you're so fortunate to have really found what you love doing and do it so well. So thank you very much, Maury Rubin. My pleasure. Thank you.